Hello, everyone. It's a very distinct pleasure to give a talk here today, so thanks to the organizers for the invitation. I would also like to add that uh, even though I'm currently a new baked professor at Johns Hopkins, I will take the opportunity to use this as a wrap-up summary of my wonderful time as a postdoctoral associate and in the Griffiths, loop at, uh, Griffiths lab at MIT, and I'm uh, kind of uh, especially happy to kind of deliver that what would be a final report. So to kind of prime us for a little bit for, for the, the, the talk today, I want to share uh, some thoughts on like a bigger picture of why I'm so interested in multi-organ microphysiological systems and their interactions. And so if you think about what are some of the biggest biomedical challenges that we face as a medical community today, COVID aside, of course, are diseases such as metabolic disorders, autoimmunity, cancer, and neurodegenerations. And we very often think about those pathology as largely unrelated, and particularly in the clinic. However, large epidemiological data and also like more and more uh, basic science data shows a picture where in fact many metabolic disorders can lead to more chronic immune altercations. Chronic immune changes can in turn lead to neoplastic changes, so for tumors. So it, those pathologies that are, of course, very complex are much more related with, than what we give them credit for. It's also in those pathologies, the, the, the thing is that it's not one gene that is responsible for it, one cell type that is involved, or one particular cause. It's very multi-dimensional, uh, multi, um, where um, many different uh, parameters can contribute to the emergence of the disease. Uh, in the same time, as researchers, we're also faced with a challenge to understand how different players, so not just different uh, tissues, but uh, how the immune system and the immunometabolic environment affect the progression and origins of those diseases. And um, if, if not yet, what I hope I would paint the picture for is really that in such complex systems that are, can be over many generations, it is very hard to understand what is the cause and in, in effect in such very complex pathologies. So if you think about all the research tools that we have available to go and start to understand what are causal relationships between those players in such complex pathologies, it's really either very complex in view models such as animal models or very simple cell culture type models. And I think personally that when it comes to multi-organ microphysiological systems and its ability to scale biological complexity, we can use these tools Aside of studying pharmacology or you know, uh, finding new drug targets, I think of them as really fantastic tools that would allow us to start look at some of those causal relationships when it comes to complex d diseases. Um, so a question is what would be unique to micro multi organ microphysiological systems as opposed to regular microphysiological systems, and I'm convinced you, if any audience, then the audience today would uh, know this, but I would just like to highlight that one can have individual tissue chips where one can just manually transfer media from one tissue chip to another, or one can have daisy-chained chips together, or one can have dedicated platforms for multi-organ interactions. Now, what is particularly challenging with multi-organ devices and multi-organ systems is, of course, that it's really uh, a number of different tissues and tissue types and biological material can be incorporated. So it's not as straightforward as just having all the same cells, but one has to think about all the different requirements that each of those tissues have. Secondly, they can be embedded in a number of different ways, so they can be circulating, they can be you know, uh, integrated in a variety of biomaterials. And also, when it comes to circulation, they can be either very passive circulation or no circulation at all. So this kind of shows you that kind of I think we're only just starting to scratch the surface of what multi-organ physiological systems can help us achieve by, but by first tackling all of those big questions in technology development as well. So particularly in my lab today and during my time in um, Lena Griffith's group is I tried to understand whether some of those multi-organ microphysiological systems could be used to separately study either what would be the cellular secretome and how tissues talk to each other, and on the other hand, how does cellular migration between different tissues informs their individual behavior. So when it comes to interorganic crosstalk, then of course we, we can be interested in a number of different endpoints, such as looking at uh, cytokine signaling, chemokine signaling, or on the other term, you know, um, uh, migrating immune cells, such as of the 
say, adaptive immune system that can be integrated in this kind of systems. And largely, which I'll talk also about today, we can use almost the same monitoring devices or endpoint tools as you would for any animal research as well. So during my postdoctoral work in Linda's lab, I uh, was kind of fortunate to be able to work with a uh, 3XGL platform developed in the lab that allowed me to integrate a number of different tissues, and I tried to use the system to evaluate for myself as a biological researcher or medical researcher whether I can use it to recreate certain facets of the gut-liver-brain axis, including circulating immune cells, and whether I can use the system to understand how microbial metabolites, such as short-chain fatty acids, affect the behavior and interaction of those tissues, and whether we can mimic certain features of what would be a, a T-cell mediated or T-cell contributing disease such as inflammatory bowel disease, and vice versa on the other end of the spectrum, something that's more chronic, more metabolically involved, uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases such as um, Parkinson's disease. So the device itself has a number of different compartments that can house individual microphysiological systems. They were designed very intuitively that one can actually use transwells, which many of us in the field are using anyways, whether we have devices or no. Uh, so the device allowed me to integrate what would be a, a microphysiological system of the gut, of the liver and cerebral system. Uh, and we were able to regulate what would be intra-compartmental circulation as well as circulation between the different compartments and kind of mediate the flow rates between them uh, to adjust for, for physiological distribution of media. Just uh, as a background, for gut microphysiological systems, we used uh, primary colon epithelial cells from either donors that have IBD or healthy donors. We grow those cells as organoids, which can be disrupted, set on transwells, as traditionally we would do. And, and with adding immune cells on the basal lateral sites, and that could be placed into the platform itself. Secondly, the liver microphysiological system is based on Linus' long-term work with liver, um, with liver chips and liver scaffolds, where we can embed primary hepatocytes together with Kupfer cells into individualized channels that allow uh, enough nutrient and oxygen flow to maintain hepatocytes for longer periods of time at a physiological relevant uh, performance. For the brain microphysiological system, I had the pleasure to collaborate with Rudolf Yenish's lab at the White Hat, where they've developed a really wonderful system where um, iPS cells from a patient that has Alzheimer's, Alzheimer, not Alzheimer's, Parkinson-specific mutation were harvested and they can be pushed into either neurons, astrocytes, and microglia. And we use those systems to kind of uh, mediate the MPS model for the brain. Uh, in the same time, I mentioned we were including, as an immunologist, I'm interested in how tissue interactions uh, inform T-cell behavior and vice versa. So we were integrating a number of different T-cell types into those kind of inter-tissue interactions as well. Uh, the ones I'm talking about today are largely T-regulatory cells and TH17 cells. They're both, their balance is extremely important to maintain kind of immune homeostasis. T-regulatory cells on one hand promote tissue tolerance. TH17 cells also kind of help us be prepared against pathogens, but if the number of TH17 cells rises over the, the number of T-regulatory cells, then that kind of is indicative of autoimmunity or autoinflammation by production of IL-17 as a highly inflammatory marker as well. So what do these tissues gain from being interacting with each other? That was one of the basic questions we had when we started the project. And in fact, what was interesting to see is that in, if, we, if we allow the gut microphysiological system, as I described it before, to talk and interact with what is a liver microphysiological system, we would see many important pathways related to nutrient uptake and metabolism being upregulated. And in the same time, if you look at what does the liver microphysiological system gain from talking to the gut, we do see that in fact uh, many pathways associated with metabolism, C450 activity, and in the same time, kind of a down regulation of uh, pathways associated with innate immune activation. So there's clearly some benefit from those tissues talking to each other. What those benefits are is definitely something that I'm working on right now and trying to understand how those interactions are really mediated, a sign of what we already know from physiology. Similarly, for the brain microphysiological system, what we were specifically interested in is whether differentiation of microglia would be more efficient in the presence of a gut-liver microphysiological system and the circulating immune cells. And what was particularly interesting, and I'll kind of, I know it's a busy slide, but I'll drag your attention to this point, is 
it's known in the field that differentiation of microglia from iPS cells is particularly difficult, so one of the more accepted protocols is to take somewhat differentiated microglia, insert them into animals, mature them, take them out, and then go and do your studies. But we are showing here that if you allow microglia to really interact with all the other systems, we can achieve a greater stage of maturation as opposed if we would just culture them based on you know, uh, previously developed iPS uh, protocols. Similarly, we, what we did is we would uh, try to correlate some of the levels of the different cytokines and chemokines in the media to what is known uh, uh, from patients in reality. So what you see in the gray area here are ranges reported in healthy patients, and in red we are looking at kind of levels of some of the indicative cytokines that we got during gut-liver-brain interactions in the presence of circulating TREC and TH17 cells. Uh, so um, can we use multi-organ microphysiological system to gain some clarity in what would be inter-organ crosstalk. And uh, I find the gut liver brain axis as a wonderful example where, in fact, we have metabolites that are produced by the gut microbiome being transported to the liver and the brain. Uh, so it's a highly interconnected system. Uh, and as much as it's interconnected during good times, during our health, it's also connected in a variety of pathologies. We know that patients with IBD are more likely to develop certain autoimmune disease of the liver. We also know that patients with Parkinson's disease often show first signs of GI pathology, so there's this many interacting components to it, but we don't really know how those are mediated. So short-chain fatty acids, for example, are a, a product of me microbial metabolism in the gut. Uh, short-chain fatty acids were, are known for decades to have many beneficial effects to the host. They're, in fact, very often try to be uh, utilized by probiotic companies or prebiotic companies to boost short-chain fatty acid production. But as of lately, we do know that short-chain fatty acids can also be associated, associated with negative health impacts. An example of that would be, in fact, Parkinson's disease, where Sarkismus menin group at Caltech showed that if you house mice that a mouse model of Parkinson's disease, if you house them under germ-free conditions, those mice will develop Parkinson's at a later stage than mice that live under normal conditions. And they were kind of able to connect that to the levels of short-chain fatty acids in those germ-free mice. So we thought the system we have would be really ideal to kind of check uh, if we can replicate that, uh, um, replicate that finding. And in fact, if we kind of uh, compare a microphysiological system of the cerebrum uh, from a patient with, that has a Parkinson-specific mutation versus to the corrective mutation, so the isogenic control of that same person. Uh, we do see some interesting insights in their interaction with short-chain fatty acids, but first things first, if we kind of compare if really we have a difference in, in their biological <coughs> behavior between PD and PD-corrected microphysiological systems, we do see that there is much more underlying fundamental inflammation stemming from the Parkinson's brain that we have as composed to, to the other ones. And so, um, kind of to make a long story short, we ran a couple of different interaction studies and different interaction modules where we would have either gut liver brain, gut liver corrected microphysiological system, presence of T cells, absence of T cells, short chain fatty acids present, short chain fatty acids absent. In all conditions, all across the board, what we saw after we add the short-chain fatty acids to the gut compartment, let them be metabolized by the liver and then reaching the brain microphysiological system, all across the board, we saw the short-chain fatty acids, in fact, re largely reduced innate immune activation as measured by cytokine release. We do see that in both cases, short-chain fatty acids were able to kind of reduce innate immune activation as was reported before. However, on a very transcriptomic level, comparing what would be the PD corrected brain versus the PD uh, pathology brain, we could see that short chain fatty acids, despite the reduction of innate immunity, we do see increases on pathology related pathways or neurons that stem from a donor that has Parkinson's disease. And that was made us, of course, curious because it's kind of a little bit disconnected with the notion that Parkinson's is a chronic uh, innate immune associated inflammation disease. Uh, we did realize that there are fundamental differences in how neurons from the Parkinson's donor versus the corrective donor metabolize, metabolize fatty acid lipids, and that was their biggest difference. And uh, in fact, we saw that if challenging the system with short-chain fatty acids, we could see that uh, neurons from a donor with Parkinson's disease would have an increased expression of pathways related to ferroptosis, which is an interesting, relatively newer uh, cell death pathway associated with accumulation of ferric irons and lipid uh, peroxidation. And we think that, you know, that's a, kind of an interesting observation. So 
At that point, I would say that some of the biggest takeaways from this study are in fact that we see if, uh, these tissues get to interact with each other. That leads to greater maturity, especially of microglia, which is a known challenge in the field. We also see that if we kind of have those tissues interact uh, and we add trojan fatty acids to that interaction, we see largely beneficial effects to the healthy corrected Parkinson's model where in fact for the Parkinson's disease model we see a negative effect of those short fatty acids and we're kind of curious to pursue these studies and understand how really interorgan crosstalk can affect chronic diseases such as uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So my full disclosure is that I've taken way too much time to get to this point and I have a whole set of other slides that I wanted to share with you which I will of course skip but what I cannot skip is really kind of mentioning all the wonderful people that I had uh, more than a pleasure to work with uh, over my time at MIT. And I have to thank my mentor, uh, Linda Griffiths, for accepting me in her lab, allowing me to use the wonderful devices, interact with Rudolf Janisch's lab, and of course also Doug Douglas Laufenberger for all the uh, computational biology insights I've learned from him. In the same time, I also have to uh, thank my current new home, which is Johns Hopkins uh, University of Medicine, and the newly founded Johns Hopkins Center for Microphysiological Systems. We are soon to launch our website, and I would just like to bring it to your attention that there is the center that we are trying to uh, use to kind of integrate all the investigators at Hopkins working in MPS technology, and I would definitely invite you to keep track of what we're trying to achieve or get in touch with us for collaborations. Thank you very much.